Thank you, Justice Sri Krishna. I am delighted to see Mrs. Kocher this evening. She taught me in school. And I am so happy that her daughter Ragini, who was co-house captain with me, is also here along with so many of my school friends. So it's like a home getting together. It's so lovely to see all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. Baron Acton had in a very famous letter of 1887 written to an archbishop called Creighton who was extolling the virtues of the popes and the kings and queens of England as heads of the church. And he said that there is a presumption that these people exercise their vast powers only for the benefit of the laity. Baron Acton disagreed and said that if at all there is a presumption the other way and which increases as the power increases. And then comes the oft quoted sentence, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The next sentence is also very pithy. Great men are often bad men. Interesting. Great men are often bad men. Even though they may exercise influence and not authority. Now, written constitutions such as ours are meant to diffuse power and are meant to see that there is no power that is concentrated in the hands of one authority or individual to the detriment of others. In fact, our constitution is one of the most prolix. It has 395 articles and is in 22 parts, as many as 22 parts. The very first declaration in the first part, India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states gives you a very, very important principle of the diffusion of power, namely the federal principle. Article 3 then goes on to delineate what the states will be and what union territories will be. A union territory being a small area of governance directly by the center, either because it is not an autonomous unit because of financial difficulty or otherwise, and needs to be brought into full statehood if it is so possible. We still have some union territories which cannot, like the Lakshwadip Islands, for example. Apart from part one, you have the great parts three and part four. Now, part three is almost the conscience of the constitution because it is it essentially delineates what citizens' fundamental rights are. And all these rights are to be exercised against the state, as we understand it. That is the legislature and the executive. Part 4 deals with directive principles of state policy, which generally tell the legislatures of, of the country, both center and state, that it is important never to forget the common man, the weak man. It's very important to remember the weak man, weak in whichever sense anti majoritarian equally. And after parts three and four, you have the great principle of separation of powers, which you have in parts five and six. So in part five, you have articles dealing with the executive central, the legislature central, and the judiciary, that is the Supreme Court. And in part six, you have the same Montesquieu and division into three parts with the states and you also deal with subordinate courts which shall be under the control essentially of the high courts. Now apart from these parts you have a very important part 11 which again then distributes legislative power between the union and the states which we'll talk about a little later. You have part 15 which is crucial to understanding that this is a democratic country because you have an election commission 
consisting of a chief election commissioner and at the moment two others who actually run the central and state elections that are to take place every five years to the Lok Sabha and to the uh, state legislative assemblies. Apart from these provisions, you have emergency provisions as to when these great principles may be abrogated or abridged depending on the situation in the country. And part 20, which deals with amendment, most important, which will also advert separately. Now, having given us this constitution, Dr. Ambedkar, one of the main draftsmen, said that what he has given us is a constitution which works, which is flexible and which is strong. If it does not work, however, man is vile. Very strong words used. What has happened in the recent past in this country is most disturbing. And if I may only share with you four things that have happened this year itself. First, in the beginning of the year, you had a BBC documentary. In fact, you had two documentaries. Speaking about our present Prime Minister as Chief Minister of Gujarat, they were promptly banned. And after the ban, the BBC was harassed by having tax raids upon it. This is the first difficult, questionable incident that took place early this year. Later in the year, you had the Supreme Court decide as to how election commissioners should be appointed. Something very, very crucial. Because if election commissioners happen to be partisan, then there is no free and fair election and there is no democracy. So the Supreme Court stated in an interim order that until Parliament decides, because Article 324, which speaks of the conduct of elections, specifically says that until Parliament so decides, it shall be the President, then went on to say that it would be fair if you are going to have independent persons as election commissioners to have the president, sorry, to have the prime minister, to have the chief justice of India, and to have the leader of the opposition as the three persons who will now appoint election commissioners. Most unfortunately, we find that a bill was moved in the Rajya Sabha, which has now become an act. Of course, it will go to the Lok Sabha and become an act in, in no time, in which the Chief Justice is substituted by a minister appointed by the Prime Minister. Now, this is the second most disturbing feature because if as a matter of fact you are going to get the Chief Election Commissioner and other Election Commissioner appointed in this fashion, free and fair elections are going to become a chimera. So, this is the second disturbing fact that we found this year itself. The third disturbing fact that we found this year is a governor of a traditionally minority government state, that is Kerala, sitting over bills for periods of up to 23 months. When the Supreme Court wrapped him on his knuckles, what did he do? There were eight such bills. One bill was assented to. Seven bills were referred to the president. Now this again is a very disturbing feature because if there is a wholesale reference to the president, then the legislative activity of the states comes to a standstill. Because unlike a governor sending back a bill and then after it is sent back, the governor then has to sign it. Once it lands up at the center's door and the center says no, that's the death. That's the death of the bill. It's over. So this was the third most disturbing feature this year. And the fourth had its impact, a tremendous impact on federalism, which was the recent Supreme Court judgment on the abrogation of Article 370. Now, the recent Supreme Court judgment, I'll deal with a little later, but suffice it to say 
that the moment a state is divided into two union territories, which is what was done here. The first question is why was this done? What was the need? Because you had already had precedence rule in the state. You were administering it from the center. So why did you need this? You needed this because you wished to bypass a very, very important article in Article 356, sub Article 5. Now, 356 essentially deals with circumstances in which there is a constitutional breakdown in a state and the center takes over. But then it is hedged with conditions. One of the most important conditions being as to time. In no circumstance can it go beyond one year. It is very important to remember. In no circumstance except two, which is given in 356.5. And neither of them obtain. First circumstance is that you should have a national emergency. And the second circumstance is that the election commission should say that elections are not possible in that state. Neither of which obtain. So how do you bypass this? You bypass it by this ingenious method of making the state union territories, where you have direct central control and no problem as to time. So essentially what has happened is that this could have continued until the Supreme Court decided the matter. In fact, it took four years for the Supreme Court to decide the matter. It was in 2019 that the state was declared as two union territories. The decision has just come. And elections, hopefully, are going to be held by September next year. So we have had no democratic government in this state for five years, which could have continued indefinitely. This is a very, very, very disturbing feature. And the Supreme Court did not decide this question. Now, it didn't decide the question because it said, we accept the assurance of the Solicitor General of India that statehood will follow very shortly and that elections will be held. Now, I remember I had said in Shreya Singhal, which was one of my early judgments, when a similar assurance was given to me by the very same Solicitor General, that governments may come and governments may go, but Section 66 capital A of the Information Technology Act goes on forever. What has happened here today is nothing less than this. The Solicitor General does not have the authority to bind any successor government. We are going to have a successor government from May next year. Second, and more importantly, he has no authority whatsoever to bind the legislature. And this is going to be a legislative act. So, to say we won't decide means in effect, you have decided. You have allowed this unconstitutional act to go forward for an indefinite period of time and you have skirted Article 356.5. These are all very disturbing things. So, let us now come back to a brief survey of what the constitution says should be done in order to diffuse power and in order to see that things like this don't happen, but then they have happened. If we go to the very first article, which I started with, that India shall be a union of states, the legislative power of the union versus the states is dealt with in part 11 and it is divided very neatly. You begin with article 245 which says that parliament makes laws for the entirety of the country or some part thereof. States make laws for the territory of a state and that they will have the power to do so depending upon whether the particular subject matter is contained in their legislative list. The union's legislative list is list one in the seventh schedule and consists of 97 entries. It deals essentially with matters of national import as opposed to regional import, national defense, banking, and many, many subjects. 
विच आर ऑफ इम्पोर्ट फॉर द कंट्री एज अ होल द स्टेट लिस्ट फॉर विच द स्टेट लेजिस्लेचर्स हैव एक्सक्लूसिव पावर ऑल्सो इज कंटेन इन लिस्ट टू इट्स अ शॉर्टर लिस्ट ऑफ सिक्सटी सिक्स एंट्रीज and essentially deals with things like police public order local self government etc list 3 is a concurrent power where both the center and the states may legislate you have subjects like education forests criminal law contracts etc now having delineated these spheres which is why we are really a quasi federal setup why quasi because there is a tilt towards the center which i will tell you about and that tilt comes in by article 248 straight away which is the residuary article that everything that you do not find in the state list parliament may then legislate upon so residuary powers which are not mentioned in the list are left only to the center the tilt becomes more pronounced as we go forward you have article 249 then where the rajya sabha may by a two third resolution pick up any one matter in the state list and say that henceforth parliament will legislate not the states article 250 is when emergency powers are used and when there is a national emergency then it may become necessary because of some external aggression or because of armed rebellion within the country for parliament to legislate on exclusively state matters under 252 you have a concept of states giving up their legislative rights to parliament like the urban ceiling act for example was made because land though a state entry entry 18 list 2 was further subdivided to urban land and urban land given up to the center so that you could have a uniform law way of urban land in the entire nation under article 253 even though a treaty may be made with another nation dealing with a state subject parliament is given the power to ultimately legislate notwithstanding this scheme that we have and finally in article 254 when the concurrent list is used usually if there is a repugnance between parliamentary and state legislation parliamentary legislation has to prevail with a proviso that if the president says that this particular state legislation should prevail in that particular state then the state legislation prevails now this is the broad scheme of division of legislative subjects and you see how there is therefore a quasi federal setup where states have exclusive powers to make laws within their ken what happens when we come to legislative activity in the houses of parliament and in the vidhan sabhas of the states first parliament article 79 declares that parliament itself consists of three organs the president the house of the people and the council of states lok sabha and rajya sabha respectively it then goes on to tell us in article 80 that the rajya sabha will be made up of 238 members essentially who are elected by legislative assembly members themselves and you have we will also have 12 others who will be otherwise taken from the union territories so far as the lok sabha is concerned you have a huge mammoth of 550 members 530 of which are directly elected and of course the constituencies are based on population so that you have up for example having 80 seats because it's the most populous and some north east sil states having one seat nagaland for example because they are the least populous so the important principle so far as these houses is concerned is that whereas one dissolves every 5 years the lok sabha so that fresh elections can be held very crucial thing for democracy the rajya sabha continues 
never dissolves because it has an automatic dissolution of one third every two years and then a re-election so far as that one third is concerned and that's how these two houses then ultimately govern our country. Now most importantly a bill can originate in either house but has to be passed by a majority of both houses. This is a very real safeguard because though there may be a party in the center who is overwhelmingly elected, that party may not have the same strength in the council of states. So that this acts as a real check to legislation and therefore we have all bills except one, namely a money bill, which I'll tell you about immediately. A money bill essentially deals with all taxation and the consolidated fund of India from which salaries are paid to everybody, executive, legislature, judiciary, etc. Now a money bill originates only in the Lok Sabha. The Rajya Sabha has given 14 days to comment on it. If it says something fine, it is then taken into account and ultimately the Lok Sabha can pass it notwithstanding what is said by the Rajya Sabha. Something like what obtains in the House of Lords today. In England, the House of Lords after 1911 and a 1949 Act is now reduced to a body which can only veto in a sense by sitting over a, a bill for a maximum period of one year because they know that if they make a comment or they say the bill should not be passed then notwithstanding what they say the Commons passes it. So that particular scheme is followed only qua money bills so far as we are concerned. And one other safeguard is that ultimately the president has to assent. If the president sends it back for, with some remarks, then again the houses have to consider those remarks and if finally they say, sorry, we disagree and we pass the bill, the president has his no option. He must then assent. But nonetheless, it is a weak form of one further check. Now, so far as the states are concerned, and before we come to the states, there's one other interesting thing. Suppose there is a bill which originates in the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha says no. Now that's not an end of the matter because the president may order a joint sitting of the two houses. And in a joint sitting, if it is then passed by the majority of those who happen to be present and voting, then the bill gets passed nevertheless. So with this caveat, you do have a very real check so far as the Rajya Sabha passing bills is concerned. When it comes to the states, unfortunately, there are very few states which have a legislative council which is equivalent to the Rajya Sabha. All of them only have legislative assemblies. There are very few with councils. So you don't have bicameralism, so to speak. But even where you do, where the bill is sent to the legislative council and is sent back and then reset, if the legislative council says no the second time, then notwithstanding that they say no the second time, the legislative assembly prevails. So we have a very different scheme so far as the legislative assembly is concerned when compared with parliament. Now we come to the very interesting thing that I spoke about in the very beginning. What does a governor do when he assents to a bill? Now the governor, unlike the president, has three choices. One, he may either assent to the bill or he may say no. In fact, he has four. Or he may send it back with some comment. Or he may refer to the bill to the president. Now, only the second proviso to Article 200 gives us some inkling of what kind of bill should be sent to the president. Second proviso says that if any legislation impacts the high courts, then compulsorily it has to be sent to the center. That gives you some idea of what the founding fathers had in mind when they said it is this type of bill that is sent to the center, not every bill. But then we have a judgment of our court, unfortunately, in BK Pavitra's case of 2019 which says 
that there is no constraint on the governor. The governor can go ahead and refer every bill if he wants to the president. According to me, this again requires a revisit. And it is important for the federal principle to work. For the Supreme Court to say in unmistakable terms that look, this bill is going to ultimately find its death at the president's door. Because the president says no, that's the end of the matter. So it is only such bills as impact the nation as a whole that require to be set and not others. Or which impact the judiciary, which is what the proviso says. So if you constrain this power to send to the president, then again we are back on the rails. Otherwise we are completely off the rails. If you have any governor in a state just wholesale sending bills to the president of India, who may then make legislative activity come to a complete standstill in an opposition state, where are we? So this is one other very, very important feature that we need to bear in mind. Now coming to the executive, the second great branch of government. We have a president who is the head of state. Now the president is elected, unlike a monarch. And the president is elected by an electoral college consisting of both the houses of parliament as well as the legislatures of the states. We, we are so concerned about the president as head of state that it is almost impossible to impeach him or her. Impeachment can take place only on the ground that he or she have violated the constitution. Ground is very broad. But you require a two-third majority of the entire house. That is the entire Rajya Sabha and the entire Lok Sabha. And what happens is procedurally, a charge is preferred for impeachment by one house. That charge has to have the requisite two-thirds strength of the entire house. The, the other house then takes up the charge. And if it is found valid, then two-thirds of that house, entire, again have to pass it. Something almost impossible. So you have ensured that your head of state remains in the saddle for five years. It's therefore very, very important to see that you elect somebody who is worthy of being head of state. Like, for example, Dr. Abdul Kalam, there should be a healthy constitutional convention where presidents, governors, etc., that ultimately you elect and or appoint, because governors are appointed, persons only of unimpeachable integrity who then fulfill the various functions they are supposed to fulfill under the constitution. And it is only when you have these people that they deserve this kind of protection. Otherwise, they don't. When you come to a governor, you have a very different scheme. A governor does, is not elected. Unfortunately, he is only appointed by the center. The article also says he is at the pleasure of the center. So despite the fact that he may have a five-year term, it can get cut short at any point without reason. Now here again, there was a problem with the original constitution which the Supreme Court has tried to iron out. Because in the 2010 judgment, BP Singles judgment, the court said that suppose you have got rid of a governor, which you are entitled to do, you don't have to give reasons. But suppose somebody comes to court and says that it is arbitrary, malafide. Then you will have to tell the court as to why you did it. And you better have a very good reason. Because if you don't, the court will then strike it down. And this is notwithstanding that the pleasure doctrine applies. So it was one very important step forward in seeing that independent governors are not thrown out. The corollary according to me is equally important that you must see that a person who is appointed as a governor in the first place happens to be independent. Otherwise, the whole, the whole scheme collapses because he has two very important functions in his own discretion, which is apart from various other functions. One is 
what I just told you about how he ascends to bills. And the other is equally important because he has to send a report under Article 356 to the center if there is a constitutional breakdown in the state. Now, if you have a governor who happens to be part of your political party who's just been kicked up for no other reason but that he should be somehow rewarded, then obviously you are not going to get an independent assessment under either Article 356 or under Article 200. So, the scheme qua governors also is fraught with a lot of difficulty. And I am waiting for the day when the Supreme Court will lay down that look, it is only independent functionaries who are supposed to fill these great offices. Not the kind of people that we find today, like we have in Kerala, for example. Where wholesale, when after you slept over these bills, you just give them back to the president. Having spoken about the second great branch, we now come to the third and most interesting, my branch, the judicial branch, or our branch, shall we say. <laughs> Alexander Hamilton, in Federalist Paper 78, now the Federalist Papers were brilliant. There were some 85 of them. And they were divided between three geniuses. Hamilton, who was the first Secretary of the Treasury, who penned 51 of these papers. Madison was the father of their constitution and the fifth president, who penned some 29 of them. And John Jay was their first chief justice, who penned only five of them. Hamilton did most of the work. And Federalist 78 is one of the most brilliant essays that you can read on a free and independent judiciary. He first says that without doubt it's the weakest branch of government. Why? Because it doesn't have force or will. It has only judgment. Also, it does not command the purse, which the legislature has, or hold the sword, which the executive holds. So, it has to depend on the executive to see that its judgments are enforced. Now, having said all this, our founding fathers tried to make the judiciary a little stronger than Hamilton saw. It, saw. In Article 124, it began by saying that, look, you can appoint judges of the Supreme Court, you the president, only if you consult the Chief Justice of India. And the practice was, for a good 40 years, that Basically, the president came out with a name, that's the government of India. The chief justice said yes or no to it. And then if the government felt strongly enough, it would still appoint the person. All this changed with the second judge's case of nine honorable judges of our court. And nine judges ultimately held that, look, independence of the judiciary is one of the pillars of our constitution. And if you really want an independent judicial, you have to have the Chief Justice of India who initiates the name. And really speaking, consultation is not consultation at all. It is concurrence. So therefore, the Chief Justice becomes the important pivot and now no longer the government. So the Chief Justice now, who is read as being a collegium of himself again to diffuse power, of himself and two senior judges, started with two senior judges, will now decide. And there was some textual evidence of the president having to consult other judges at that time, Supreme Court, High Court. So they said, all right, if he is to consult other judges, then surely the Chief Justice himself should consult other judges. And these judges should be, in every case, two other senior judges. Two became five in the presidential reference case. Of again, again of nine judges of 1998. So, so far as the higher judiciary, the Supreme Court is concerned, you have a collegium now of five judges who really do the appointing. Now, we are often asked this question, how is the collegium system working? I was part of it. I would say, like Churchill said famously, 
that democracy is the worst form of government except all other forms. So that's how it's working. It is the worst form except all others. We certainly can't revert to the earlier form. So therefore, I'm going to suggest at the end what we should do if we are really going to have a judiciary which is filled with independent fearless judges. So, so this is so far as appointment is concerned. Now, interestingly, there was a constitutional amendment that was passed, the 99th amendment, about seven years ago. And it was almost unanimously passed by both houses of parliament. And what did that amendment say? It said we'll have a judicial appointments commission. The commission will now consist of a chief justice, two senior Supreme Court judges, the law minister, and persons of eminence who will be appointed by the same trio that was spoken of by Justice Joseph in the election commission case, namely the prime minister, leader of opposition, chief justice. This was unanimously struck down by five judges saying, no, you will interfere with the independence of the judiciary and therefore we are back to square one or rather square two because square one was given up earlier. So this is where we stand today so far as appointment is concerned. A Supreme Court is, uh, the judge's tenure is till the age of 65, which is why both of us have retired fairly early and are now enjoying ourselves, fortunately. And importantly, the Supreme Court judges are looked after by the consolidated fund, salaries are charged on the fund, in every other sense, they have, a, they have good conditions of work today. So that finally we have a superior judiciary who does have a reasonable mix of judges. The high courts again have the same kind of system but with two other authorities added. You have the chief justice of the high court, you have the governor of the state as well. And of course, primacy given to the Chief Justice of India's opinion. So that finally, you have this collegium system. There it is three, center it's five, who essentially appoints the superior judiciary. When you have to get rid of judges, again, you can do so only on impeachment. And on two grounds, narrower than the presidents, which if you remember, I told you was any violation of the constitution. Here it is for misbehavior or incapacity and here unlike the president so long as you have two-thirds of both houses present and voting that is not the entirety of the house a much lesser number is accepted out goes the judge so so far as judges are concerned they are on a pedestal somewhat lower than that of the president then you have very important articles dealing with the rule of law in this country. You have article 141 where the Supreme Court judgments bind other courts and tribunals. You also have article 144 which is a very important article which takes care of what Hamilton said that you have to depend on the executive to see that your judgments are followed through. Here you don't have to depend on the executive, you depend on the constitution. Because the constitution says all authorities, whoever they are, are bound to follow the Supreme Court. Very, very important article that has left nothing to doubt. And above all, article 145.3, because 145.3 essentially says that the last word on the interpretation of the constitution is with a minimum of five judges of the Supreme Court. Very, very, very important. You also have, unlike in the United States, Article 13, which specifically speaks of judicial review of legislation. Because if you have legislation that violates the Constitution, which is a higher law, then the courts have the power to strike it down and say it is bad. Now, that is not left as was left to the great Chief Justice Marshall to develop case by case 
that is a specific article of faith in our constitution also you have article 32 which is perhaps the only article of its type in any world constitution that you have a fundamental right to approach the supreme court to enforce your fundamental right it's a remarkable thing that dr ambedkar introduced and said was the soul of our constitution as indeed it is along with this soul comes the high courts under article 226 who do pretty much the same thing and even more because they can protect not just your fundamental rights but other rights as well a wider power now therefore armed with all these powers we have a judiciary who can interpose itself as it's supposed to between a very powerful government a very powerful legislature and the citizens of this country whichever group they be and therefore a lot of the fears of alexander hamilton are looked after by our constitution when you deal with the great judiciary that we have given ourselves now apart from the judiciary we come to the other great important pillars of our constitution you remember we spoke of the election commission now the election commission can be appointed that is the chief commissioner and two other commissioners can be appointed and are appointed by the president of india which is the government of the day you remember i told you that the supreme court suggested that you have this collegium of three consisting of the prime minister leader of the opposition and the chief justice by the way the supreme court didn't pick up a rabbit from a hat the supreme court picked up parliament's own practice because parliament in 2014 when you appointed the cbi director somebody of far less relevance at the national level than than in than an election commissioner when you appointed a cbi director you had the same three by legislation and look at what has happened today the supreme court looking at the cbi legislation that is looking at parliament at what parliament itself has done suggested these three and these three get subverted instantly by your now passing a bill and it will become an act in no time where you will have two from the executive prime minister and minister against the leader of the opposition which is two to one always and out goes the election commission so there's not much point saying that you're going to appoint a person when you are not sure he's going to be independent but give him the tenure of five years and that he can be removed that is the chief election commissioner can be removed only like a supreme court judge by the way the other two election commissioners can be removed but not like a supreme court judge so long as the chief election commissioner says that they may be removed they can be removed so the fulcrum therefore is the chief election commissioner and we have to see now how our court reacts when this bill becomes an act and i'm certain that is going to be challenged according to me it should be struck down for the asking as an arbitrary piece of legislation because it severely imperils the independence of the working of the election commission because if the fulcrum itself the salt has lost its savor wherewith shall it be salted apart from the election commission you also have the speakers of legislative assemblies and the union parliament the rajya sabha speaker is the vice president ex officio otherwise the speaker depends upon the majority of the house to appoint him now when persons or when mps and mlas get disqualified on various grounds could be of unsound mind not citizen of india undischarged insolvent etc who is to decide whether this disqualification is correct or not it can only be the election commission again a very important pointer to the election commission being an absolutely independent body so the election commission decides and the president then passes the order in accordance with what the commission says but 
when it came to defections ayaram and gayaram in the 10th schedule somehow or the other the speaker became the repository of this confidence now i remember i have in one of my judgments from manipur seen the working of the 10th schedule right from the 1980s when it was enacted by the 52nd constitutional uh, uh, amendment and one of the first cases that came to the court was the speaker himself defecting so much for this great authority you know who is a person who is above board and who supposed to decide disputes now that gentleman defected to become chief minister and having got having having dealt with matters like this in my experience i therefore suggested that there be an election tribunal permanent tribunal consisting or headed, headed by some retired supreme court judge to decide all these disputes or at the very least to have the election commission decide them as in the case of all other disqualification so this again is one other difficult area which needs to be sorted out because we find that speakers of either the legislative assembly or of parliament very often when it comes to the disqualification on the ground of defection of a person belonging to the ruling party will just sleep over the matter won't decide best way of continuing and if the opposite obtains then you disqualify the other gentleman instantly and then he will have to take his time in approaching the courts and god alone knows what will happen after he approaches the courts so we have these problems and we need to address all these problems apart from the election commission you also have one very very important safeguard in our amendment article now we had various forms of amendment put before the founding fathers they were all very difficult so the founding fathers chose an intermediate route and you have four types therefore of amendment one type of amendment is where like in article 3 you do not do away with a state but you alter the name of a state you may alter its boundaries etc and pass legislation to that effect of course in effect you are therefore altering a part of the constitution the first schedule gets altered but they say that doesn't have to pass the drill of article 368 so that's one type of amendment by ordinary law the second type of amendment is as if you have in article 11 where for citizenship the constitution begins with who are our citizens and then leaves it to parliament in its wisdom to then say whatever it wants about citizens including abrogating provisions of the constitution that's the second type but the most usual type is what falls within four square within article 368 which is if you change any part of the constitution you require to have a two third majority again present and voting of both the lok sabha and the rajya sabha and the amendment then gets passed on the president signing it and then you have the fourth type the fourth type is if you impact certain subject matters such as the election of the president the executive power of the union or the states legislative relations between union and states articles 245 to 254 entries in the seventh schedule representation of states in parliament or amendment of the article itself then you require not only two third majority in both houses but also ratification by one half of the states of course a fifth method was tried again in the jammu kashmir case but fortunately the court struck it down what was that fifth method dr dieter conrad had written a very interesting article he was a german professor and germany as you know went through world war 2 and after world war 2 and its experience with hitler and the weimar constitution decided to say that there are certain basic things in their constitution which cannot be touched so he advocated the same thing qua our constitution and gave four very interesting examples telling examples of what would happen 
if we did not follow basic structure, which happens to be a matter of debate again today. First, he said, suppose you were to abolish the constitution and have a monarchy, bring back the king. Can you do it? You can if you have the requisite two-third majority and you have half the states in your pocket, you can do it, no problem. All right. Second, suppose you abolish Article 21, no personal liberty. So, instantly you are turned from a democracy into a dictatorship by this. Can you do it? Third and very interestingly, he said, suppose you give amendment of the constitution to the president of India. And exactly this happened. When this slew of government orders were passed for Jammu Kashmir, one very interesting order was that I, the president, will by my order amend the constitution directly. What will I do? I say you interpose sub article 4 in article 367 and say that the constituent assembly mentioned in article 370, which is abrogated, be now read as legislative assembly. This fortunately the court struck down and says no, it is not possible. So as a matter of fact, what Dieter Conrad envisaged way back in 1966 has actually happened. So everything that is envisaged has till today happened. So it is very, very important therefore to remember that the court has always helped us when we've had troubled times such as when we've had the 39th amendment. If you remember, the 39th amendment was only there in order to see that a prime minister who had lost in an election was still prime minister and above the law. In short, I am not going into it in detail. Now, that 39th amendment would have passed muster because the requisite strength, the muscle was there. You had the two-third majority, you had half the states. But basic structure stood in the way. And interestingly enough, four out of those five judges who decided were minority judges in Kesavananda Bharti who said there's nothing like a basic structure. Four of them had to apply the majority judgment and each of them gave a different reason as to how basic structure was impacted and the 39th amendment failed. So, coming to the end, fag end now of this long lecture, sorry for having detained you people for so long. May I only say this, we started out, if you remember, with the four examples I gave you of what's been happening in this country this year. The moment there is any onslaught on the media, the courts must be vigilant to instantly scotch it. If you find that there is some independent reporting which has led to something, as a result of which there is a tax raid, then for that reason alone, without more, you must say that tax rate is illegal and unconstitutional. That's the only way you can protect the media in this country. Otherwise, you are finished. It is the watchdog. It is our watchdog. And if our watchdog is killed, then there's nothing that remains. So this is the first important thing that I would like to suggest. The second is Quay governors, if you remember. Have a healthy convention of appointing persons who are independent. And I gave the example of Dr. Abdul Kalam. You have people from who are doing so well in this country, from so many walks of life. Why don't you look for that, that pool instead of looking for the pool of your own politicians who, who you wish to somehow or the other push up? This is one. Second, very important to overrule or dilute BK Pavitra. You remember I told you that judgment, which says that when a bill comes into the hands of a governor, without more, he just sends it to the president. That's the end of the bill and that's the end of federalism. So that needs to be looked into. And most importantly, when the governor is removed, we still fortunately have a judgment which says, when he is removed, though he is at the pleasure of the center, if he is removed mala fide or arbitrarily, 
reasons have to be given to the court and his removal can be set aside. So this is so far as governors are concerned. The election commission I have dealt with in extenso. The election commission also, when this matter comes up before the Supreme Court, I hope that this bill, which now will become an act, will be struck down. I sincerely hope, because if it is not, then it is fraught with the greatest danger to democracy that I can see. And finally, if I may come to the judiciary itself, as I told you earlier, we do have our collegium system, which is the worst, but then there's nothing better. Now, I would only suggest, and this is not for the near future, this is looking into the distant future. I would suggest that you have instead a collegium of retired judges. Now, who will select those retired judges? The bar. The practicing bar of the Supreme Court and the High Courts. Because the bar are our judges. Judges have judges, incidentally. And we are judged all the time by practicing advocates. As both Janak and Darais will tell you. So, it is important to have practicing bars all over the country who vote for retired judges like the present, who are known for their independence, who will then sit with a secretariat, be consulted by everybody, including the Chief Justice of India, Chief Justice of High Courts, Law Minister, the works, and ultimately recommend persons for the higher judiciary. If this happens, then your present slew of judges, where you have outstanding judges in the High Court and Supreme Court, then you have a lot of people who are only in transit, and you have some who are more executive-minded than the executive. The proportion within these three will then drastically change. And if it drastically changes, and mind you, this is only my hope for a future, God alone knows if it happens and when it happens. It is only when that happens that we can honestly say that Dr. Ambedkar's words will no longer obtain. Thank you all very much.